Hendrik Anton Lorentz was a Dutch physicist who shared the 1902 Nobel Prize in Physics with Peter Zeeman for the discovery and theoretical explanation of the Zeeman effect. He also derived the transformation equations subsequently used by Albert Einstein to describe space and time. According to the biography published by the Nobel Foundation, it may well be said that Lawrence was regarded by all theoretical physicists as the world's leading spirit, who completed what was left unfinished by his predecessors and prepared the ground for the fruitful reception of the new ideas based on the quantum theory. For this he received many honors and distinctions during his life including, from 1925 to his death in 1928, the role of chairman of the exclusive International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation. Biography Early life Hendrik Lawrence was born in Arnhem, Gelderland, the son of Gerrit Friedrich Lawrence, a well-off nurseryman, and Geertrude van Ginkel. In 1862, after his mother's death, his father married Luberta Hupkes. Despite being raised as a Protestant, he was a freethinker in religious matters. His results in school were exemplary, not only did he excel in the physical sciences and math, but also in English, French, and German. In 1870 he passed the exams in classical languages which were then required for admission to university. Lawrence studied physics and mathematics at the Leiden University, where he was strongly influenced by the teaching of astronomy professor Frederick Kaiser. It was his influence that led him to become a physicist. After earning a bachelor's degree, he returned to Arnhem in 1871 to teach night school classes in mathematics, but he continued his studies in Leiden in addition to his teaching position. In 1875 Lawrence earned a doctoral degree under Peter Ridgick on a thesis entitled Over der Theory der Terrakathsing and Breaking van het Licht, in which he refined the electromagnetic theory of James Clerk Maxwell, career professor in Leiden in 1877, only 24 years of age. Hendrik Anton Lawrence was appointed to the newly established chair in theoretical physics at the University of Leiden. The position had initially been offered to Johan van der Waals, but he opted for a position at the Universiteit van Amsterdam at the last moment. On January 25, 1878, Lawrence delivered his inaugural lecture on De Molecule Theorien in der Natur Kunder. In 1881 he became member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. During the first 20 years in Leiden, Lawrence was primarily interested in the theory of electromagnetism to explain the relationship of electricity, magnetism, and light. After that, he extended his research to a much wider area while still focusing on theoretical physics. Lawrence made significant contributions to fields ranging from hydrodynamics to general relativity. His most important contributions were in the area of electromagnetism, the electron theory, and relativity. Lawrence theorized that atoms might consist of charged particles and suggested that the oscillations of these charged particles were the source of light. The experimental and theoretical work was honored with the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1902. Lawrence name is now associated with the Lawrence Lorentz formula, the Lawrence force, the Lorentzian distribution, and the Lawrence transformation. Electrodynamics and relativity in 1892 and 1895 Lawrence worked on describing electromagnetic phenomena in reference frames that move relative to the luminiferous ether. He discovered that the transition from one to another reference frame could be simplified by using a new time variable which he called local time. The local time depended on the universal time and the location under consideration. By that, he could explain the aberration of light and the result of the Fizeau experiment. Lawrence's publications made use of the term local time without giving a detailed interpretation of its physical relevance. 
In 1919-04, Henry Poincaré called local time Lawrence's most ingenious idea and illustrated it by showing that clocks in moving frames are synchronized by exchanging light signals that are assumed to travel at the same speed against and with the motion of the frame. In 1892, with the attempt to explain the Michelson-Morley experiment, Lawrence also proposed that moving bodies contract in the direction of motion. In 1899 and again in 1904, Lawrence added time dilation to his transformations and published what Poincaré in 1905 named Lawrence Transformations. It was apparently unknown to Lawrence that Joseph Lama had used identical transformations to describe orbiting electrons in 1897. Lawrence's 1904 paper includes the covariant formulation of electrodynamics, in which electrodynamic phenomena in different reference frames are described by identical equations with well-defined transformation properties. The paper clearly recognizes the significance of this formulation, namely that the outcomes of electrodynamic experiments do not depend on the relative motion of the reference frame. The 1904 paper includes a detailed discussion of the increase of the inertial mass of rapidly moving objects in a useless attempt to make momentum look exactly like Newtonian momentum. It was also an attempt to explain the length contraction as the accumulation of stuff onto mass making it slow and contract. Lawrence and special relativity in 1905, Einstein would use many of the concepts mathematical tools and results Lawrence discussed to write his paper entitled On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, known today as the Theory of Special Relativity. Because Lawrence laid the fundamentals for the work by Einstein, this theory was originally called the Lawrence-Einstein Theory. In 1906, Lawrence's electron theory received a full-fledged treatment in his lectures at Columbia University published under the title The Theory of Electrons. The increase of mass was the first prediction of Lawrence and Einstein to be tested, but some experiments by Kaufman appeared to show a slightly different mass increase. This led Lawrence to the famous remark that he was, at the end, of his Latin. The confirmation of his prediction had to wait until 1908 and later. Lawrence published a series of papers dealing with what he called Einstein's principle of relativity. For instance, in 1909, 1910, 1914, in his 1906 lectures published with editions in 1909 in the book The Theory of Electrons, he spoke affirmatively of Einstein's theory. It will be clear by what has been said that the impressions received by the two observers AO and A would be alike in all respects. It would be impossible to decide which of them moves or stands still with respect to the ether, and there would be no reason for preferring the times and lengths measured by the one to those determined by the other, nor for saying that either of them is in possession of the true times or the true lengths. This is a point which Einstein has laid particular stress on, in a theory in which he starts from what he calls the principle of relativity. I cannot speak here of the many highly interesting applications which Einstein has made of this principle. His results concerning electromagnetic and optical phenomena agree in the main with those which we have obtained in the preceding pages. The chief difference being that Einstein simply postulates what we have deduced with some difficulty and not altogether satisfactorily from the fundamental equations of the electromagnetic field. By doing so, he may certainly take credit for making us see in the negative result of experiments like those of Michelson, Rayleigh and Brace not a fortuitous compensation of opposing effects, but the manifestation of a general and fundamental principle. It would be unjust not to add that besides the fascinating boldness of its starting point, Einstein's theory has another marked advantage over mine, whereas I have not been able to obtain for the equations referred to moving axes exactly the same form as for those which apply to a stationary system. Einstein has accomplished this by means of a system of new variables slightly different from those which I have introduced. 
though Lawrence still maintained that there is an ether in which resting clocks indicate the true time, 1909. Yet, I think, something may also be claimed in favor of the form in which I have presented the theory. I cannot but regard the ether, which can be the seat of an electromagnetic field with its energy and its vibrations, as endowed with a certain degree of substantiality, however different it may be from all ordinary matter. 1910. Provided that there is an ether, then under all systems X, Y, Z, T, 1 is preferred by the fact that the coordinate axes as well as the clocks are resting in the ether. If one connects with this the idea that space and time are completely different things, and that there is a true time, then it can be easily seen that this true time should be indicated by clocks that rest in the ether. However, if the relativity principle had general validity in nature, one wouldn't be in the position to determine whether the reference system just used is the preferred one. Then one comes to the same results, as if one deny the existence of the ether in of true time, and to see all reference systems as equally valid. Which of these two ways of thinking one is following, can surely be left to the individual. Lawrence also gave credit to Poincaré's contributions to relativity. Indeed, for some of the physical quantities which enter the formulas, I did not indicate the transformation which suits best. That was done by Poincaré and then by Mr. Einstein and Minkowski. I did not succeed in obtaining the exact invariance of the equations. Poincaré, on the contrary, obtained a perfect invariance of the equations of electrodynamics, and he formulated the postulate of relativity terms which he was the first to employ. Let us add that by correcting the imperfections of my work he never reproached me for them. Lawrence and general relativity Lawrence was one of few scientists who supported Einstein's search for general relativity from the beginning, he wrote. Several research papers and discussed with Einstein personally and by letter. For instance, he attempted to combine Einstein's formalism with Hamilton's principle, and to reformulate it in a coordinate-free way. Lawrence wrote in 1919, The total eclipse of the sun of May 29th resulted in a striking confirmation of the new theory of the universal attractive power of gravitation developed by Albert Einstein, and thus reinforced the conviction that the defining of this theory is one of the most important steps ever taken in the domain of natural science. Assessments Einstein wrote of Lawrence, 1928, The enormous significance of his work consisted therein that it forms the basis for the theory of atoms and for the general and special theories of relativity. The special theory was a more detailed expose of those concepts which are found in Lawrence's research of 1895-1953. For me personally he meant more than all the others I have met on my life's journey. Poincaré said of Lawrence's theory of electrodynamics, the most satisfactory theory is that of Lawrence, it is unquestionably the theory that best explains the known facts, the one that throws into relief the greatest number of known relations. It is due to Lawrence that the results of Fizeau on the optics of moving bodies, the laws of normal and abnormal dispersion and of absorption are connected with each other. Look at the ease with which the New Zeman phenomenon found its place, and even aided the classification of Faraday's magnetic rotation, which had defied all Maxwell's efforts. Paul Langevin said of Lawrence, It will be Lawrence's main claim to fame that he demonstrated that the fundamental equations of electromagnetism also allow of a group of transformations that enables them to resume the same form when a transition is made from one reference system to another. This group differs fundamentally from the above group as regards transformations of space and time. Lawrence and Emil Wicke had an interesting correspondence on the topics of electromagnetism and the theory of relativity, and Lawrence explained his ideas in letters to Wicket. The correspondence between Lawrence and Wicket has been published by Wilfried Schroeder. Lawrence was chairman of the first Solvay conference held in Brussels in the autumn of 1911.
Shortly after the conference, Poincaré wrote an essay on quantum physics which gives an indication of Lawrence's status at the time. At every moment, the 20 physicists from different countries could be heard talking of the quantum mechanics, which they contrasted with the old mechanics. Now what was the old mechanics? Was it that of Newton, the one which still reigned uncontested at the close of the 19th century? No, it was the mechanics of Lawrence, the one dealing with the principle of relativity, the one which, hardly five years ago, seemed to be the height of boldness. Change of priorities In 1910 Lawrence decided to reorganize his life. His teaching and management duties at Leiden University were taking up too much of his time leaving him little time for research. In 1912, he resigned from his chair of theoretical physics to become curator of the physics cabinet at Teller's Museum in Harlem. He remained connected to Leiden University as an external professor, and his Monday morning lectures on new developments in theoretical physics soon became legendary. Lawrence initially asked Einstein to succeed him as professor of theoretical physics at Leiden. However, Einstein could not accept because he had just accepted a position at ETH Zurich. Einstein had no regrets in this matter, since the prospect of having to fill Lawrence's shoes made him shiver. Instead Lawrence appointed Paul Ehrenfest as his successor in the chair of theoretical physics at the Leiden University, who would found the Institute for Theoretical Physics which would become known as the Lawrence Institute. Civil work after World War I Lawrence was one of the driving forces behind the founding of the Wettenscher Pellige Kommissie van Advisen on Dizok in het Belang van Volkswelvart, en we behide, a committee which was to harness the scientific potential united in the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences for solving civil problems such as food shortage which had resulted from the war. Lawrence was appointed chair of the committee. However, despite the best efforts of many of the participants the committee would harvest little success, the only exception being that it ultimately resulted in the founding of TNO, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. Lawrence was also asked by the Dutch government to chair a committee to calculate some of the effects of the proposed of Sloot Dyke flood control dam on water levels in the Wadensee. Hydraulic engineering was mainly an empirical science at that time, but the disturbance of the tidal flow caused by the F. Sloot Dyke was so unprecedented that the empirical rules could not be trusted. Originally Lawrence was only supposed to have a coordinating role in the committee, but it quickly became apparent that Lawrence was the only physicist to have any fundamental traction on the problem. In the period 1918 till 1926, Lawrence invested a large portion of his time in the problem. Lawrence proposed to start from the basic hydrodynamic equations of motion and solve the problem numerically. This was feasible for a human computer because of the quasi-one-dimensional nature of the water flow in the Wadensee. The Afsloot Dyke was completed in 1932 and the predictions of Lawrence and his committee turned out to be remarkably accurate. One of the two sets of locks in the Afsloot Dyke was named after him. Death in January 1928, Lawrence became seriously ill and died shortly after on February 4. The respect in which he was held in the Netherlands is apparent from Owen Willens Richardson's description of his funeral. The funeral took place at Harlem at noon on Friday, February 10. At the stroke of 12 the state telegraph and telephone services of Holland were suspended for three minutes as a revered tribute to the greatest man the Netherlands has produced in our time. It was attended by many colleagues and distinguished physicists from foreign countries. The president, Sir Ernest Rutherford, represented the Royal Society and made an appreciative oration by the graveside. Unique 1928 film footage of the funeral procession with a lead carriage followed by ten mourners, followed by a carriage with the coffin, followed in turn by at least four more carriages, passing by a crowd at the Grote Markt, Harlem from the Zeelstraat to the Smederstraat and then back again through the Grothoutstraat towards the Bartel de Ristraat.
On the way to the Algemana Bagrara, it's at the Clevelan has been digitized on YouTube. Einstein gave a eulogy at a memorial service at Leiden University. Legacy Lawrence is considered one of the prime representatives of the Second Dutch Golden Age, a period of several decades surrounding 1900 in which in the natural sciences in the Netherlands flourished. Richardson describes Lawrence's man of remarkable intellectual powers, although steeped in his own investigation of the moment. He always seemed to have in his immediate grasp its ramifications into every corner of the universe. The singular clearness of his writings provides a striking reflection of his wonderful powers in this respect. He possessed and successfully employed the mental vivacity which is necessary to follow the interplay of discussion, the insight which is required to extract those statements which illuminate the real difficulties and the wisdom to lead the discussion among fruitful channels, and he did this so skillfully that the process was hardly perceptible. M.J. Klein wrote of Lawrence's reputation in the 1920s. For many years physicists had always been eager to hear what Lawrence will say about it when a new theory was advanced, and, even at 72, he did not disappoint him. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Lawrence received a great many honors for his outstanding work. He was elected a foreign member of the Royal Society in 1905. The Society awarded him their Rumford Medal in 1908 and their Copley Medal in 1918.